Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Graves. I'm here to introduce our anthropology colloquium speaker um, this morning. Our speaker is Catherine Peck, who's going to give a, a talk on research that she's conducting in Hawaii. Just a couple of announcements to make before we start. I've been told that for the purposes of the Zoom portion of this, uh, it's best if everyone keeps their camera off during the lecture so we don't clog up our, um, uh, the, <clears throat> the screen with images of us. Secondly, uh, there will be time at the end of the talk for questions. So you can <clears throat> post them into the chat uh, function on the Zoom and Catherine can take them up uh, at the end of her talk. Uh, the talk that Catherine's going to give today is entitled South Kohala Leeward Field System, Ancient Management, Modern Resilience. And this is her PhD dissertation research uh, here at UNM in archaeology. Um, <clears throat> although there are several aspects of this work that are uh, interesting and should be interesting to everyone in the audience, <clears throat> I just want to note two of them. One is the active and direct involvement in the Native Hawaiian community that lives in the area where this work is being conducted in the creation of the research and the research design. So <clears throat> there's been uh, long, there's been from the very get-go their involvement, their approval of, of the research that Catherine's conducting. And then secondly, um, Catherine's working in an area where we see the combination of what look like where they should be dryland agricultural fields that are being fed, at least in part, by flow irrigation. And this is an unusual combination in Hawaii. Usually they're either wetland on the wetter side of the island or you have dryland fields. So this is unique in that aspect. And it's, I think, one of the features that Catherine's going to talk about today. And then finally, you know, we should note that this is the Frida Butler Award talk that had to be postponed from last spring when the pandemic started. But we now have the opportunity to hear it through the technology of Zoom. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Catherine, uh, turn on my mute and stop. Um, thank you, Michael, um, for the introduction. Um, and thank you so much to um, Dr. Wallace and to the Department of Anthropology for um, setting up this colloquium series and for um, giving me an opportunity to share my research with you all today. Um, as Michael said, I'm going to be talking about my dissertation research. Um, and that research is centered in an area um, that um, we've been referring to as the South Kohala field system. This is a ancient agricultural field system in the uplands of Kohala, which is the northern peninsula of Hawaii Island. Um, this photo here on the title slide is a photo that I took in January of 2019 um, when I was uh, in the field. And you can see um, a landscape that I think, um, particularly if you haven't spent a lot of time in, in Hawaii, is very surprising. I think if it weren't for the ocean, I could show this to someone and say, that it was somewhere in the American Southwest and I think it would look pretty accurate. Um, one thing to point out is that in the foreground of this image, um, you can see a series of linear alignments going from the left to the right um, towards the, the ocean, towards the back of the image. Um, those are the, the field borders. Those are remnants of uh, this field system. Um, and these are just four or five of a network of several hundred of these features that stretch um, throughout this entire study area that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, this study area, as I mentioned, is located in uh, Kohala. Um, this uh, map on the left here shows that portion of Hawaii Island that I'm gonna be focusing on. You can see um, a couple of things to note. One of them is the really stark contrast between the windward side um, the wet side of the island and the leeward side of the dry side of the island. Um, the area that all of these fields are located in is actually um, on that dry side and pretty far down the slope. Um, one of the sort of uh, interesting things about this landscape is that by virtue and part of that incredibly dry landscape, features show up really, really well on satellite imagery. 
So before I went out at all into the field, I was able to map from satellite imagery, and you can see a screenshot of that on the right, um, almost all of, well, all of the visible archeological features. Um, uh, I realized as I was preparing for this talk over the past few weeks that I actually, two years ago, almost exactly to the day, that was the first time that I actually got to go out um, into the field um, and view uh, these features. Um, I had been to Hawaii before, I had looked at this landscape from um, the air for about a year mapping these, agri uh, these agricultural features in, but I hadn't been out there. Um, and in that first trip, um, uh, Michael and I um, went out to collect soil samples for uh, my master's paper. It was a very unique experience getting to see that landscape for the first time. I thought I knew a ton about this landscape um, just from, from having mapped it for so long, but being able to walk out there um, and uh, walk through some of these areas, I began to see little landscape clues that you can't sort of know from the air. Areas where water tends to pool, little rock alignments um, that don't show up. Um, and I was sort of overwhelmed that first week just by how um, beautiful and dense the cultural landscape is. Um, it became clear that, you know, this isn't just a place to look at agriculture, it's a place um, a place where people lived and spent time in and, and shaped their landscape, um, both in terms of the agricultural features and um, the cultural features like residential features and religious features. Um, in, addition, in addition to starting that field work um, that October two years ago, um, I also got a chance for the first time to meet with some of the people who are um, interested in this landscape and who care about it deeply. Um, I got to meet with members of the Kailapa Community Association. Um, uh, Kailapa is a Hawaiian homestead located in coastal Kauai High. Um, I've indicated it on the map on the left. So just below the area that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, members of that community um, and that community association have been working over the past few years to develop a long-term sustainability and resiliency plan for their community and a big um, component of that plan involves managing these upland agricultural fields um, for a variety of reasons that I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, getting to talk to these folks about their plans, um, about their interest in the landscape, really shaped the way that I thought about my research project, uh, thought about my research questions, and thought about how I was going to collect and share my data. Um, and I, so that's, there's kind of two dimensions um, to the presentation today that I'm going to be talking about that Michael also alluded to. Um, there's the archaeological and environmental and sort of geospatial aspect of this project that I'm going to be talking about. I'm also going to be talking about uh, the community aspect of the project and how I'm going to be um, structuring my research to include those interests and um, how I'm going to be structuring our project to share data um, with those interested parties. Um, but first I wanted to step back a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the uh, broader archaeological, geological, and historical background um, in this area. I know I threw out a lot of place names um, just now and so I wanted to kind of contextualize um, the landscape and the, the places that I'm going to be talking about. So as I said, this research is located on Hawaii Island. Um, Hawaii is the big island, the biggest and youngest island in the Hawaiian archipelago. It's the island that has Mauna Kea, um, which is shown here in this photo that I actually took this past February from the study area. Um, you can see the summit is totally snow-capped. We were there in, in the winter. Um, there's also uh, several other major volcanoes on the island, uh, Hualalai, Mauna Loa, and Kilauea. Um, which you probably remember um, erupted pretty dramatically two years ago, um, a little bit before I was here for this field work. Um, uh, the Hawaiian Islands are a classic example of what's called hotspot volcanism. Um, this is a process where um, a mantle plume or a hotspot uh, brings up magma from the Earth's mantle and erupts it onto the crust, onto the ocean floor. Over time, that lava builds up into islands, which eventually, uh, which uh, break the surface of the water. Um, and over time, the Pacific Plate on which these islands sits moves to the northwest, 
and the hotspot stays stationary. So you get a linear alignment of islands, which in the case of, of the Hawaiian Islands stretches way far to the northwest to uh, Midway Atoll and, and um, the area that's now the Papanau uh, Marine. But of the main Hawaiian Islands, um, Hawaii is the youngest and the biggest, and uh, Kauai and Niihau are some of the youngest. And those ages are important because um, the uh, current landforms and processes that you see active on these islands are a component of those ages. Um, so on the island of Kauai, you have uh, very deep and dissected valleys um, throughout the island and particularly on um, an area called the Nepali coast. On the island of Hawaii, on the other hand, it's a largely uh, not uh, extremely eroded shield. Um, there's some gulches and some valleys on the windward side, um, but you're still having a sort of a buildup of um, material through volcanic processes, um, whereas on Kauai, for instance, you have uh, volcanic processes replaced almost, replaced almost completely with erosional processes. Um, this geological um, setup with these really high island interiors has a significant um, uh, impact on the climate. So um, in the Pacific, uh, the trade winds tend to blow to the west southwest. Um, and these um, like Hawaii and like all of the other Pacific archipelagos, um, the rain clouds um, rise and cool. And when um, and when they cool, they rain a whole bunch on the eastern sides of the islands um, where the wind is pushing them. Um, and then the clouds continue to move to the west, but now they're depleted of water. And so the um, leeward or western sides of the islands are very dry. Uh, you can see the dramatic impact of that divide in a place like Kohala, um, especially. And this sort of uh, brown to green transition is uh, partially a component of uh, breeding and, and deforestation, but it is also um, uh, a result of, of that leeward windward divide. Um, on the leeward side of the island, you have areas that get um, as little as 250 millimeters of rainfall a year. On the windward side, you get um, several thousand millimeters of, of rainfall a year. And like I said, you can see that impact in the landscape. The leeward side is, has a few um, gulches and, and streams, and the windward side has these very deep, um, in some cases incredibly wide um, valleys. All of these factors, climate, uh, geology, have a significant impact on Hawaiian soils and soil development. So even though the underlying geology of Hawaii is um, largely mafic, so um, iron-rich, uh, magnesium-rich volcanic rocks, um, there's an incredible diversity of, of soil types. Uh, this diagram shows an area on the island of Oahu on the windward side, so that's for the island. The areas at the high elevation that receive the most water have soils that are very leached of their nutrients um, because over time, the water erodes away the nutrients and, and washes them out. Um, conversely, the coastal plain, um, sort of above the beach, has um, very nutrient-rich soils. These are soils called um, uh, mollusols, um, which tend to characterize grasslands, and they're found in places like the plains of the U.S., so really great agricultural soils. Um, and uh, in this situation, they're found in the areas of lowest rainfall on the side of the island because the rain has, um, over time, eroded nutrients out of the base rock, but has not rained enough for all of those nutrients to have been washed away. Um, so these uh, environmental settings offer a variety of different places for people to settle and conduct agriculture. So I also want to talk a little bit about how people actually got uh, to the island of Hawaii, which is in and of itself a really interesting and complex topic, which I can't really do justice to in a short presentation. But um, I can say that um, the sort of the story of the peopling of the Pacific um, in general starts uh, tens of thousands of years ago when people started to move out of island Southeast Asia into um, into eventually into Australia, into areas like Papua New Guinea and the Bismarck Archipelago, which is to the west um, in this image. 
um, starting about um, 3,000 years ago. Uh, and this, I should say, this is all watercraft and, and sea voyaging, um, thousands and thousands of years before we see this elsewhere. Um, starting about 3,000 years ago, we see a movement out of that Western area and into the area that we call Polynesia, which is an um, anthropological term for the culture area that includes the area of the Pacific bounded by Hawaii, Rapa Nui, and New Zealand. Um, as people start to move into um, Western Polynesia, there's sort of a pause um, of settlement. And then around 1000 CE or AD, um, we see movement into Central Polynesia, and then a pretty rapid um, pattern of settlement into the remote, uh, the remote parts of, of Oceania, areas like Hawaii and Rapa Nui and New Zealand, which are thousands of, of miles from, from the you know, center of this triangle. Um, and, you know, these dates are being, you know, they're often revised, but uh, uh, the current archaeological understanding is that Hawaii was settled by people um, around 1000 AD uh, CE. Um, and uh, they, these uh, initial Polynesian settlers brought with them a transported landscape of Polynesian flora and fauna that originally came from areas in island Southeast Asia and uh, um, the Western Pacific. This includes plants that you probably associate with Hawaii today, plants like taro, coconut, breadfruit, sweet potato, sugarcane, bananas, as well as animals like pigs, dogs, chickens, and rats. Um, Hawaii and um, many of the other areas, uh, many of the other island groups in Polynesia had a really complex organizational system, um, a uh, complex uh, grouping of chiefs who managed uh, different parts of the island. Um, in Hawaii, this is what that system looks like. Um, each island um, up until the 19th century was under the control of one chief, Finali Inui. Um, and then the islands were further broken up into smaller districts or moku. And so Kohala, which is where my research is uh, located, is one such district. Um, within those moku or district, there's an even smaller land division into Ahupua'a. Um, Ahupua'a are also um, districts for land tenure. Um, and one of the cool things that you can see about Ahupua'a, which are the um, white um, areas circled on this map is that they basically cut up um, the island into slices from coast to mountains. So, um, and each of these Ahupua'a were in turn managed by another smaller chief, a Konohiki, or a, a, a land manager. Um, and by virtue of having um, these districts organized in this way, if you're living in, in Ahupua, you theoretically have access you know, with the Konehiki's permission to resources from the coast to all the way up in the mountains. Uh, so you can, uh, you can fish, you can gather shellfish, you can have fish ponds on the coast, and you can go up to the very top of the Ahupua and gather wood for, for canoes and, and hunt and, and gather uh, birds' eggs. So all of the areas of this Ahupua have some kind of resource um, that is available to people living in it. Um, this system of land management continues into um, the 19th century, which is when um, you see a couple of big shifts in Hawaii. Um, Captain Cook uh, arrives in Hawaii in 1778, and very shortly after that, more Europeans and more, Euro -Ameri uh, more Americans arrive as planters, as missionaries. Um, but at this point, um, Hawaii is still under Hawaiian control. And in fact, um, around the time of Captain Cook and into the early 19th century, Kamehameha I um, begins to, who was a, a, the paramount chief of the island of Hawaii, begins to uh, conquer the other islands and eventually by 1810 um, becomes the monarch of the first, the first monarch of the kingdom of Hawaii. So he controls all of the islands um, in the island chain for the first time. Um, another big change that happens in the 19th century um, is you start to see a movement away from uh, this Ahupua'a system where there's sort of a management by chiefs and into uh, a setup called fee simple ownership, which just essentially means that individual people own 
individual parcels of land and they can improve and do what they want with those parcels of land. Um, and this started to happen over the course of about a decade um, in the 1840s and 1850s, where um, lands were essentially broken up and given to individuals um, based on their claims to the land, which were assessed by a, um, a land commission. Um, some of the lands, such as Kauai Hai, which is the Ahupua that I'm uh, interested in working in, um, were not were largely unclaimed and so were retained by the crown as what's called crown lands. In the end of the 19th century, um, the United States uh, moves in and annexes Hawaii, uh, deposing the reigning monarch, uh, Queen Liliokalani. And again, another um, event and, and process that deserves a lot more discussion, but for uh, the purposes of Kauai Hai and this area in Kohala, what that meant is that that land, that crown land, was then um, transferred to the US government for ownership. Um, uh, once um, in the 1920s, uh, with the passage of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, all of those lands that were in trust, formerly owned by the Kingdom of Hawaii, now by the US government, um, managed by a newly created Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And the purpose of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is to oversee these trust lands and award the lands to uh, native Hawaiian beneficiaries. Um, parcels of land are leased to beneficiaries at relatively low cost for pastoral agriculture or homesteading purposes. So Kailapa, which is the community that I've been working with, is a, home, a Hawaiian homestead. Those lands have been leased to beneficiaries for homesteading. This photo is a photo I took um, in January um, from one of the houses in Kailapa. And you can see kind of how um, what that landscape right on the coast where these houses are uh, kind of looks like. Transitions into one of the main um, aspects of this talk, um, which is the community interests and concerns uh, that folks in, in Kailapa have. This is another photo um, of that homestead taken from just above uh, uh, the main area of the, the neighborhood. So this area of Kailapa, it's beautiful, as you can see from the pictures I just showed. But it has, um, it's very dry to start. There's not a good permanent source of water near the community. Um, it's very susceptible to fire. Um, in January, before we went out there for field work, there was actually a big fire just about in that area that I took the picture from that burned several acres and was, um, until it was put out, was in big danger of jumping down and, and directly impacting uh, the houses in the community. Um, this area will also, over time, likely be more susceptible to the effects of climate change, both of rising sea level and increased intensity of storms since it's right on the coast. Um, it's also overall susceptible to natural disasters. For instance, um, in 2006, there was a big earthquake and hole, a bridge that goes over a gulch and connects um, Palapa to the rest of the island. And so for several weeks, the residents were without um, easy access to grocery stores and other resources in town. Um, Another, and one of the, the biggest concerns that I've heard expressed from people in Kailapa is the rising cost of water. So as I said, Kailapa doesn't really have a um, good permanent uh, water source in their area. Um, the reservoir underneath it is already being tapped by various sources and it's um, apparently hard or, or not possible at the moment to put in more wells. And so over the next decade or so, uh, water costs in the community are predicted to rise by um, like 400%, um, fourfold increase in water costs. So in light of those concerns and some of the other concerns I've mentioned, um, Kailapa, the Kailapa community started developing this um, resiliency and sustainable development project with the idea of um, finding reliable water sources, um, doing projects that include reforestation and erosion mitigation, um, putting in um, pastoral and agricultural lots in the uplands, um, developing methods for fire mitigation and access in and out of the community and evacuation uh, through multiple routes rather than just one, um, and a, a goal for putting in uh, sustainable energy because utility costs in general are very high in this area. 
And uh, what all these, these components of this plan mean is essentially taking um, over the management of the upland area uh, that I've been studying um, to put some of these um, projects into place. Um, and the main, uh, this, this plan is laid out in a document that uh, Kalapa has produced called Ehu Ehu Ikapono, which roughly translates to thrive and balance. Um, and uh, there's sort of three main uh, components of this plan, water, land, and people by Aina and Kanaka. Um, and the uh, primary, this is a figure from that report, or that um, resiliency plan, which is very detailed. Um, and uh, you can see that their long-term plan for community resilience involves managing this entire Ahupua'a as um, it might have been traditionally managed. So um, in the coastal areas, um, putting in sustainable fishing, um, salt harvesting, um, areas for community members to exercise, restoring some of the historic trails that once connected people on the coast to people in the uplands as part of that access route plan. Um, in uh, the uplands, you see forest restoration, forestry, um, trying to restore some of the natural um, water sources and aquifers. Um, and in the middle section, um, one of the um, ongoing plans is adaptive reuse and preservation of the archaeological um, areas in uh, the middle part of the Ahupua'a. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about now the archaeology of that area. We've heard about um, sort of the general context um, and why people in Hawaii are interested in this landscape. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my research and what I've been doing to learn more about this area. Um, in general, um, Hawaiian agriculture can be divided into two sort of broad types. One of those types is called pond field agriculture. This is an irrigated form of agriculture uh, that's generally practiced on um, the wetter sides of islands, so windward sides of younger islands or in uh, the older dissected islands in valleys. Um, this is a uh, type of agriculture that's traditionally uh, thought of as being used to grow pond field taro, so taro that's, that's flooded uh, most of the time. And the photo up top is of a restored taro lo'i or pond field um, on the windward side of, of Hawaii Island. Um, uh, the picture below is a picture of a dryland field system in Kohala as well on the leeward side, north of the area that um, I'm studying. Uh, dryland field systems, you can see um, the difference in the landscape between these two photos. It's almost no trees. Um, the, the area that's being cultivated is pretty vast as well. Um, and these agricultural uh, dryland field systems tend to be used to grow plants like sweet potato um, and also tend to be found on younger volcanic flows, often on larger islands like Maui and Hawaii, as well as on uh, younger flows on older islands like Molokai. Um, there's several of these big field systems on the island of Hawaii, in Kona, in Kau, and in Kohala. Um, this uh, dichotomy between pond field and dry land is a good way to generally think about Hawaiian agriculture, but there is a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more to it than that. So this is a photo of Kohala and you can see the different kinds of agricultural uh, activities and strategies that are present there. Um, the area that's called study area, that's the area that I've been working in and that I've been mapping. Area to the north, the big orange swath, is an area called the Leeward Kohala Field System, which is a rain fed dry land field system that I just have on the other side of the island, pond field irrigation, as well as agroforestry. Um, and back just south of where I'm working, um, there are other fields uh, in the Waimea Field System, which have some evidence for um, flow irrigation um, in addition to traditional. Um, field borders. So that kind of brings me to the main thrust of my uh, research question and my sort of thinking about um, this project. Given the um, potential limitations of a landscape like this, um, as you can see from how dry it is in that area that I've been mapping in, um, 
I'm interested in thinking about how natural and anthropogenic factors interact over time to shape agricultural productivity in a theoretically marginal environment. So for instance, how um, enriched is the soil? Is that enrichment natural or has it been impacted by humans? How did people manage the water in the past um, through irrigation, through um, erosion control features, manipulating natural drainages? What kind of plants did they grow? And were they using uh, the typical suite of Hawaiian plants that you might see in a dryland setting? Or were they changing their strategies to include plants that are a little more drought tolerant? Uh, what role did larger social pressures play? Was there um, pressures, for instance, associated with the rise of Kamehameha and the building of his monumental heiau, which is near um, this location. Uh, heiau is a, a temple. Um, that push people to uh, move into areas they might not normally have moved into. Um, and this area is a really good uh, study area to be asking these questions about limitations and agricultural strategies. So this is a map a little bit more zoomed in of the same study area I've been working in with rainfall iso, ISO heads and uh, the underlying geology. So uh, most of the archaeological features in this area can be found below that um, line that says 750. That's 750 millimeters of rainfall per year. Um, the majority of the features can also be found on the yellow area, um, which is a much older geologic uh, flow. So you have two things that might theoretically be working against agriculture in this area. It's on a substrate that is theoretically, or it might be depleted in nutrients, and it's also in an area of low rainfall. Um, but um, despite that, there's clearly a huge number of agricultural features. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I first started this project in August of 2017. And my first task was to map all of the um, archaeological features that I could see on satellite uh, imagery. So a form of remote sensing, but a very simple sort of um, mapping process. And one of the things that you can see is that there's this really dense chunk of fields. And um, in the uplands, these linear um, lines that go from the greener part into the drier part with all the fields, those are a combination of drainages, modified drainages, and anthropogenic uh, human-constructed flow irrigation ditches, um, which uh, we believe were part of a huge um, project of water management that was meant to bring water from the wetter upland areas into these relatively dry um, fields. Um, which is likely to be one of the major limiting factors in this area because um, based on some of the soil research that I've started to do, which is another big part of my project, it seems like these fields might actually be it, um, more enriched in nutrients than we might expect. So um, the first time I went out there, I did those first five samples um, in red. And since then, when I've gone back, I've started a new transect to the south and I've also continued to transect um, up, taking two soil samples at each of these locations, um, just the top 30 centimeters um, of soil. Uh, each of those soil samples is getting analyzed for a combination of, of nutrient um, measures, including phosphorus, which is a really important limiting nutrient, um, and a few other um, soil specific measures like base saturation and cation exchange capacity, which is also a measurement of the availability of nutrients in the soil. Um, and this is important because um, previous research on soils in this area has kind of delineated these three major zones for soil enrichment. There's an upland zone, which like that photo I showed or the figure that I showed earlier in the presentation is very depleted of soils because it's had a ton of rainfall and all those nutrients have been leached out. There's also the lowest zone, um, which has little rainfall. And so theoretically, it hasn't been weathered enough for there to be um, nutrients in the soil. And then there's kind of an intermediate zone where the combination of rainfall and um, substrates is just right, where there's enough rainfall to make nutrients available from the substrate, but not so much that all those nutrients have been washed away. Um, and this is kind of a simplified um, 
concept, there's it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because not only does rainfall play a role, but the age of your substrate play plays a role. So if you have a younger substrate at a lower elevation, it probably won't have a lot of available nutrients in the overlying soils. But if you have an older substrate, you've had more time to weather it, and so you may actually have nutrient enrichment, meaning that you could theoretically farm a lot lower on the slope than in areas um, like the leeward Kohala field system where the substrates are a lot lower. Um, there's also a question in addition to um, naturally, whether these soils are naturally enriched, how people might have played a role in the enrichment of the soils. So these are two photos from uh, Rapa Nui on the left and from New Zealand on the right, which show the ways that humans manipulate their soils in the Pacific. So on the left is a, a rock mulch garden um, where people put down a huge um, layer of basalt cobbles, which has a couple different uses. It can insulate the soil, it can prevent evapotranspiration, and it can add more nutrients to the soil as those rocks break down. You see similar patterns in New Zealand um, with these plagan soils, which are uh, soils that have mixed rock and shell for similar purposes, for both insulation and for release of, of nutrients. So um, my big question with soils is how enriched are they? They should potentially be quite nutrient rich, even though this area is very dry. And, but if they're not, or even if they are, how are people managing their soil resources in this area? Um, the rock mulch question I think is really interesting because throughout this area, there's a huge, um, uh, blanket of rock cobbles on the surface, which it's kind of hard to tell at this point whether they're anthropogenic or natural. They are likely, there's likely natural, there's a ton of bedrock that's eroding in this area, but it might have a similar effect. This, this you know, coating of rocks might have an effect of acting as mulch, even if it's not um, placed specifically by people. Um, the soil nutrient um, data, that's still something that's coming in and, and I'm studying, but um, right now it does seem like these areas are enriched nutrients. So I've included one measure that we've taken, which is base saturation, and that's the um, amount of available um, magnesium, uh, potassium, and calcium um, in the soil as a percentage of, of the whole, um, uh, of all of the cations. So, um, the picture on the right is um, from soils in the leeward Kohala field system to the north. And you can see that in the, um, within the rainfall range, um, the soils in the South Kohala field system look like they have comparable or even higher base saturation. So there are available nutrients in the soil. Um, but the question is, even though the soil is very rich, can you actually grow uh, plants there without water? And that's sort of the big third, um, the big as other big aspect of this um, project is mapping water management features and trying to determine how people were um, were using their water resources and making new water resources. So um, in the uplands above the road, sort of to the right of the image, there's a couple of features that were actually mapped um, in the 90s during a CRM project as ditches. Um, and there's a question of how old those actually were. Um, but elsewhere, um, lower down, um, the combination of infield survey and um, satellite imagery, we've identified several other features that look like ditches. They're U-shaped um, and linear and go into um, areas, they go off of natural drainages and into areas where there are agricultural fields. Um, in some cases, um, these are likely natural drainages that have been manipulated, but in some cases they are uh, dug out. So for instance, this um, network of ditches seems to start far up in the uplands, um, comes down across the area where there's a road today, and then into um, another network of um, drainages and, and ditches. Um, this is that same ditch network and kind of give you a sense of what these look like. It's not super apparent in this image, but in the center there is a uh, ditch that has been dug out and goes straight down the slope towards um, an area of fields. Um, but in addition to flow irrigation, um, there also 
seems to be a larger pattern of, of water management that includes features called check dams, uh, which are walls that were built in this area across drainages that slow the flow of water and likely build up soil behind them to be used as planting areas. Um, the picture on the left is from a check dam that's just above um, the area of densest fields um, in the bottom of the study area. Um, so in addition to water manipulation, we also see an attempt to manage uh, water resources to prevent erosion um, and uh, contribute to uh, more planting surfaces. Um, and the photo of the right is another ditch or a Y um, that looks like it's been dug out and potentially dug into bedrock in, in that place, which is a kind of ditch that you see elsewhere in, in Hawaii as well, especially on the windward side. Um, the final dimension um, of the project is the question of when were these features built and is there any potential uh, possibility that their construction was associated with social pressures. So that's a little bit difficult to say because when you do, um, when you test radiocarbon material from the period that I'm most interested in, which is from the uh, 1600s onward, um, calibrating those radiocarbon dates is sort of um, imprecise. You get a lot of potential um, peaks in that radiocarbon curve. But at the moment, it looks like the features, the majority of features, the majority of field borders in the system were constructed after 1600, potentially into the 1700s, which is um, the late 1700s being the time when um, Kamehameha was coming to power and ha had a lot of influence in this area of Kohala. Um, and so that's kind of an uh, important part because if fields were put in here uh, for as a result of social pressures, then maybe that suggests that the area was not particularly good for agriculture and was kind of a last resort. Um, and all of these sort of dimensions of this project, um, some of them are very archeological, like the question of, of social pressures and their role um, in the construction of the field system. Um, but some of them I think have a lot of potential value um, for um, the Kailapa community. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what I see as the value of my archaeological data for this community and how um, archaeologists might try and structure projects to contribute to uh, modern sustainability and resilience goals. So going back to Kailapa, um, they have, uh, as I talked about earlier in the presentation, they have a number of concerns about um, their community's long-term sustainability, including um, uh, trying to grow their own food, trying to mitigate fire, trying to mitigate erosion. Um, and so I think um, understanding landscape constraints um, is potentially really important for adaptive reuse as well as um, some of the other projects that they would like to do. And I remember when I first started talking with folks from Kailapa, I was got really excited because I realized there's a ton of ways in which my archaeological research interests on this landscape intersect with, with what they're interested in doing. I'm obviously interested in how people in the past managed their surface water, um, how they used it, how they got it to different places. Um, people in Kailapa are concerned about water use, availability, and sustainability today. Um, I'm interested in uh, soil quality, soil suitability for agriculture. Kailapa is potentially interested in adaptive use and putting agriculture back in some of those um, ancient fields. Um, there's also um, interest in, you know, having access and evacuation routes out of the community. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, historically documented trails that go from coast to, um, and back. Um, which we've also observed when we've been up on this landscape. And so that's another big overlap of interests. And then finally, uh, my interest in this landscape um, is also in terms of how Hawaiians over long periods of time uh, manage their resources um, in a sustainable or potentially not sustainable way, how soils are impacted, how, um, how this environment um, was managed and manipulated by people and how that environment may have dictated some of that management. 
Um, and so there's a couple, in addition to those sort of more nebulous overlapping interests, there's also some very specific ways that I see this project being able to provide useful data to this Hawaiian community. Um, one of which um, sort of the first and most obvious is this is gonna be a survey of upland resources. I'm documenting um, archeological sites, um, where they are, um, what their function was, um, potentially when they were used. So there's um, features up there that are likely quite old. And there's also features that were um, residential and other features that date to the 19th, um, potentially as late as the late 19th century. Um, knowing what's up there culturally will be important um, if uh, the community decides to go forward with some of their plans for, for instance, sustainable energy. Um, there's also generally a survey of the natural resources, um, which is not as official um, as the archaeological survey, but um, we've observed things like kukui growing in gulches um, in an otherwise treeless landscape, um, which community members have expressed a lot of interest in what grows up there today um, and how useful is it. There's also observations on um, stream flow and how intermittent stream flow is um, that we can provide just by virtue of being up there a lot. Um, this archaeological project also um, provides a justification for modern management of this landscape. One of the things that we've observed is archaeological sites in the uplands that have been significantly impacted by erosion, um, which is ultimately caused by the um, herds of, of ungulates, goats, and cows um, in the uplands, uh, which create game trails throughout the landscape. And over time, um, because they've also been eating the vegetation, um, soil cohesion decreases and uh, water can erode along these paths a lot more easily. So the photo on the left is actually of an emu, an earth oven um, that has been completely cut through um, by erosion. And the photo on the right is just down slope of a house site. And all of those pin flags um, represent areas where archaeological or artifacts are eroding out of, out of the slope and coming down as a result of the game trail that goes right through the, the house platform. So um, this is sort of a justification for particularly the reforestation and erosion mitigation projects that Kailapa and other sort of um, upland organizations are interested in putting in place. And also an argument for potentially more sustainable ranching um, uh, practices. Um, finally, there's the question of how suitable is the landscape for adaptive reuse? And that's a question that's still ongoing and, and will continue to be investigated over the course of this project as I continue to test soils and document um, features. You can, essentially can these water management features be put back um, into use and can um, the soils be or are the soils still nutrient rich as they may have been in the past um, what um, additions might be needed to the soil today um, if they're not uh, to make them viable um, and so I wanted to finish by giving some kind of final thoughts about this landscape about um, the work I've been doing um, it's been a very rewarding experience. Just, I mean, you can see from the photos I've shown, it's an absolutely beautiful landscape. And I feel incredibly lucky to be able to spend time out there and grateful um, for members of the Lapa community for being interested in the research and for supporting the research in various ways. Um, uh, and so I feel that um, as I continue with this project, I am definitely gonna continue um, sharing data. So every time I've gone out there, I've done some kind of presentation um, to the community, formally or informally. Um, we've also prepared reports for them about what we've been doing and documenting. Um, I also want to continue to structure this research project in a way that supports um, community goals and whose methods support community goals. Um, so in trying to be minimally invasive to the archaeological record, and focusing on on questions that will produce data that will not just answer interesting archaeological questions but be um, important to management today um, and that's important because i'm planning on continuing to do 
um, research in this area. Um, I was back this summer. Um, I will likely be back out there again next summer, uh, continuing my soil sampling, continuing documentation, um, and continuing to share um, this data, um, and also broadening my methods a little bit. Ideally, I'd like to get light image detectioning, detection and ranging um, imagery, which is very fine scale elevation data, and also um, test some of these soil samples for pollen and phytoliths, which would tell me about um, what plants were grown in this area in the past, which would also be um, a really interesting data point um, for folks in the community if they are if they go ahead with the adaptive reuse plan. Um, I wanted to finish by thanking you all so much for showing up and, and logging in and viewing this talk today. Anthropology and Dr. Wallace for setting up this lecture. Um, of course, uh, this project would not have been possible without the support of the members of the Kailapa Community Association, um, all members, um, but especially um, members like Diana Maha Kanealii, who let us stay with them um, during several of these field sessions, um, and Amu and Godfrey Kainoa, who helped us get um, access to the gate that leads down into this area. Um, I also wanted to thank the Ortiz Center, uh, UNMG PSA, and Brad Wiley, who provided some of the funding for this project. And of course, my advisor, Michael Graves, the members of my master's and dissertation community uh, committee, and some of the other professors at UNM who have helped, um, uh, who have read and offered comments on uh, various aspects of this project. And finally, some folks in, in Hawaii who um, helped with the field work, including Kiko Brown, Kama Plunkett, Rick Merkin, um, Kihau Marshall, and Sophia Verde. Um, so thank you to them, and thank you again uh, to all of you for, um, listening to my presentation this morning. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was really great. Um, so yeah, I, I would love uh, people to, to ask questions. Uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, a new strategy for question and answers has evolved, and I think it's worked really well. And that is that if you have a question, I would suggest you just turn on your uh, camera and ask the question. Um, uh, and, uh, and we can um, and then go to a couple questions that are, I see here in, in the chat. But if you, if you have a question, um, yeah, please just turn on your camera and ask. Hey, Ozzy. <laughs> Hi, yeah, the great presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if there's any way to get like buried soils in there and maybe compare some of the composition of them to more recent ones? So um, one of the aspects of the soil research moving forward that I'd like to do is a process where um, not buried soil specifically, but what you can do is you can look at the ratio of phosphorus to the ratio of niobium or other immobile elements in the soil compared to the ratios in the other line substrate. And by normalizing those values, I can kind of give you um, an idea of how many nutrients were left over. And so I don't know how possible it would be to get buried soils, especially since um, the soil development period that we're looking at is relatively short in this area. But I might be able to get a sense of what past soils look like versus what modern soils look like by doing um, a comparison like that. Thank you. Um, I had one question. I was fascinated uh, at the at the beginning when you showed um, a map of uh, divisions uh, across the island of the, the territories of different chiefdoms, um, and uh, and just the also thinking about that sort of in the uh, um, in parallel with the information you provided about just the, the ecological variation uh, around the island. And I was wondering if um, if among these different um, uh, uh, cultural groups, um, you, you see major differences in diet or people eating the same uh, things and making them in different ways or are they maybe having similar diets but uh, you know maintaining those through trade or something like that. But I can't help but notice that like you know there's, <laughs> there's definitely ecological differences among these different uh, groups. Um, yeah there definitely is um, there's going to be a difference in the resources that are available 
in these different areas and probably even within some of these ahupa are, are big like the it would take time to move between different areas within them um and certain areas like i know in in kau it's pretty dry um drier i think as dry or drier than the area i'm looking at um and does not have a lot of soil development so it would have been hard to grow a similar um suite of plants um, one of the um, sort of concepts that I've seen um, to kind of explain how people dealt with this is that there probably was a lot of interaction and trade between people um, across these ahupuas. Um, and that's uh, one of the, the, there's a paper that came out sort of recently that argued that, you know, there's going to be seasonal variation in the amount that you can actually produce. And so in order to mitigate against shortages, you would um, trade and share and cooperate between Ahupua to kind of um, even out those shortages. In terms of differences in, in diet, um, I think even though there's a lot of environmental variation, you still have very, you have similar agriculture Real practices. I don't think that um, diet difference would be very strong within the island, but in the whole of Polynesia, you do see, um, for instance, in New Zealand, which is very cold, um, or not very cold, but much colder than Hawaii and some of the other islands, um, you see different emphasis on different kinds of food. So in Hawaii, uh, uh, taro is a really important crop. In New Zealand, you can't really grow taro except for some areas in the north. Um, so sweet potato becomes really prominent. Same thing in, in Rapa Nui. So um, people made choices to um, use different um, crops and plants that were the best suited to the environments that they lived in, depending on where they were. And so you probably see that to agree in a degree in here, but I'm not sure how that, um, how much that impacts the daily diet of people within the island. Hi, Lola. Excellent. Hey there. Great presentation, Catherine. Thank you so much. And because I know that you've had um, a growing involvement with the local community, I wanted to ask, have you, do you have plans already in place or have you begun to work with some of the community um, youth or other ways to involve them directly, whether it's in the field surveying and work or even in the data processing and landscape characterization work that you're doing with um, the satellite imagery, et cetera? So at the moment, um, I don't have a specific plan in place for that, but it's an idea that I know we've talked about when we've been in Hawaii, Michael and I, and I've talked to members of the community about that. It's, I would really love to be able to involve people, kids or, or young people or other community members in the process of research. Um, and just generally in, in since, you know, as archaeologists, we have access and vehicles to get up into this landscape, bringing people up there to see the resources that are up there. Um, I think there's a lot of really good potential opportunities to do that with this project. Um, so for instance, that um, Google Earth mapping um, that I did, um, you, you do have to kind of know what the features look like, but once you learn, um, it's a pretty simple process to do, especially with a program like Google Earth. I think that would be a great way to um, involve some younger people, maybe in continuing to map the upland areas or maybe in mapping um, some of the coastal resources. There's a parcel of, of land um, on the coast that has a bunch of archeological features that Kailapa recently just got control over, um, or they got, permission to manage it um, and prevent people from coming in and like ATV and camping. Um, so teaching people how to use satellite resources to map areas and kind of observe change over time. I think that'd be a really cool thing to do. And at some point in the future, I'd love to, to incorporate something like that into the project. I, I just think it has a ton of potential and it's, and it's also, of course, for you career wise, it's a really important facet of building that long-term research enterprise and community involvement and co co management co direction of the research as well as obviously the data and result sharing and all that that you've already got well laid out good good job nice nice stuff <laughs>
Hi, um, I was wondering if, so you talked about how C14 dates aren't gonna be super helpful for dating your features. I was wondering if you had considered, um, particularly with more recent stuff, um, if like OSL was gonna be something that could help you at least in a few key areas to just sort of anchor what your dates might be since they're uh, much more recent constructions. So, but with OSL, it's something that I'm not as familiar with, but um, I know, ideally it'd be really cool to use something like that to date irrigation ditches um, if I had material that was buried and could be tested. Um, the problem, I think, geologically for the kind of OSL dating that I'm familiar with um, is there's not really um, quartz grains or other kinds of crystals that would preserve that kind of data um, in these flows that would get eroded out. Um, I think, and I, I, I really don't know much about this either, but um, one of the things I talked about with the soil scientists in Hawaii was potentially um, something like cosmogenic um, radionuclide testing um, on some of the buried material, um, which might be more reliable than um, radiocarbon dating. But yeah, that's, that is an ongoing um, problem that I'm trying to figure out how to solve. For some of the most recent stuff, um, there's actually um, areas, like I showed that little ceramic shirt, sure, there are features that have um, midden that can be dated to specific historic time periods. So after 1800, that, that can constrain those dates, but in that kind of 1700, 1650 to 1778 period, that will be a little difficult. And that is something I'm trying to figure out how to resolve. Any other questions? Well, I, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, um, I am very fascinated uh, by the connection but, um, with your research with um, uh, with the potential to, to reuse these lands, uh, perhaps using similar uh, agricultural practices as were used before. Is there any discussion about, um, um, well, I'm just curious. So these are archaeological sites. You know, yeah. uh, would people be concerned about reusing them maybe for agriculture simply because they're uh, uh, archaeological sites and have a, a historical importance to them? Yeah, I think there is um, a concern about that. I mean, there's definitely sites in this area that should not be disturbed or used um, because of their ritual significance um, or um, archaeological potential, like some of the house platforms. Um, I think one of, one of the, the things about this landscape, so it's very dry. In the past, it actually may have been a little bit wetter because over time, the forest line has significantly receded due to deforestation, due to grazing. Um, so it might be the case that even after all of this, after learning about the resources and the soil nutrients, that those furthest fields furthest down that are the densest and most archaeologically significant might not even be possible to be put back into use. And they may have to move that adaptive reuse project or that um, planting project further up the slope anyway into areas that have fewer archaeological sites. Um, and that might be, again, I'm, I'm still not sure yet, but might be more viable for agriculture today. So yeah, there is a concern. Um, I, th I think, I, I think, and I, I don't know for sure, I think that um, it would be an appropriate use of some of the fields to put in, to have you know people in Hawaii come up, manage them and replant them. There are a couple other projects in Hawaii where folks have done stuff like this. Um, there's a project, a research project um, in another Ahupua to the north where they're trying to reintroduce um, and, and test the viability of planting stuff like banana and sugarcane in these mala, in these dry land plots, unirrigated. There's also a project on the windward side of the island, um, a woman named Nani Svensson who owns a uh, terolo'i, which is that picture that I showed of the terolo'i, who has also um, put those lo'i back into practice. And so I think there's ways to sort of, you know, as archeologists to gather data and sort of determine what areas might be reusable. Um, and then I think, I think folks would be um, sensitive, obviously, of the sites that are, are most important and shouldn't be messed with.
yeah, sure. I guess part of part of your job is to identify what the, you know those areas. So that makes that makes complete sense. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, fascinating. Um, any other uh, questions? Well, if there are no other questions, we'll we'll uh, give uh, Catherine a round of applause uh, uh, virtually. Or uh, and and uh, thank you very much uh, for for the talk today. And um, and and yeah. Is, uh, I, is, is somebody trying to make one last question? Okay, I think we're good. I think we're good for today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Catherine. All right, everybody, same time, same place next week. Have a great weekend.